Volume One, Letters Thirty One through Thirty Six of the History of Emily Montague. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Emily Montague, Volume One, by Francis Moore Brook. Letters Thirty One through Thirty Six. Read by Amanda Friday as Arabella Fermore kit Nusis, as edward rivers alan maxstone as john temple letter thirty one to miss montague at quebec i congratulate you my dear you will at least have the pleasure of being five or six months longer your own mistress which in my opinion when one is not violently in love is a consideration worth attending to you will also have time to see whether you like anybody else better and you know you can take him if you please at last send him up to his regiment at montreal with the Melmus stay the winter with me flirt with somebody else to try the strength of your passion and if it holds out against six months absence and the attention of an agreeable fellow i think you may safely venture to marry him apropos to flirting have you seen colonel rivers he has not been here these two days i shall begin to be jealous of this little impertinent mademoiselle clairon adieu yours a fermor rivers is absurd i have a mighty foolish letter from him he is rambling about the country buying estates he had better have been here playing the fool with us if i knew how to write to him i would tell him so but he has got out of the range of human beings down the river heaven knows where he says a thousand civil things to you but i will bring the letter with me to save me the trouble of repeating them i have a sort of an idea he won't be very unhappy at this delay i want vastly to send him word of it adieu ma chere letter thirty two to miss rivers clarges street camarascus october tenth i am at present my dear lucy in the wildest country on earth i mean of those which are inhabited at all tis for several leagues almost a continual forest with only a few straggling houses on the riverside tis however of not the least consequence to me all places are equal to me where emily is not i seek amusement but without finding it she is never one moment from my thoughts i am every hour on the point of returning to quebec i cannot support the idea of her leaving the country without my seeing her "'Tis a lady who has this estate to sell. "'I am at present at her house. "'She is very amiable. "'A widow about thirty, with an agreeable person, "'great vivacity, an excellent understanding, "'improved by reading, "'to which the absolute solitude of her situation has obliged her. "'She has an open, pleasing countenance, "'with a candour and sincerity in her conversation "'which would please me, "'if my mind was in a state to be pleased with anything. "'Through all the attention and civility "'I think myself obliged to show her, she seems to perceive the melancholy which I cannot shake off. She is always contriving some little party for me, as if she knew how much I am in want of amusement. October 12th. Madame de Roche is very kind. She sees my chagrin and takes every method to divert it. She insists on my going in her shallop to see the last settlement on the river, opposite the Isle of Barnaby. She does me the honour to accompany me with the gentleman and lady who live about a mile from her. Isle Barnaby, October 13th. I've been paying a very singular visit. Tis to a hermit, who has lived sixty years alone on this island. I came to him with a strong prejudice against him. I have no opinion of those who fly society, who seek a state of all others the most contrary to our nature. Were I a tyrant and wished to inflict the most cruel punishment human nature could support, I would seclude criminals from the joys of society, and deny them the endearing sight of their species. I am certain I could not exist a year alone. I am miserable even in that degree of solitude to which one is confined in a ship. No words can speak the joy which I felt when I came to America on the first appearance of something like the cheerful haunts of men, the first man, the first house, nay, the first Indian fire of which I saw the smoke rise above the trees, gave me the most lively transport that can be conceived. I felt all the forces of those ties which unite us to each other, of that social love to which we owe all our happiness here. But to my hermit, his appearance disarmed my dislike. He is a tall old man with white hair and beard, the look of one who has known better days, and the strongest marks of benevolence in his countenance. He received me with the utmost hospitality, spread all his little stores of fruit before me, fetched me fresh milk and water from a spring near his house. After a little conversation I expressed my astonishment that a man of whose kindness and humanity I had just had such proof could find his happiness in flying mankind. I said a good deal on the subject, to which he listened with the politest attention. "'You appear,' said he, "'of a temper to pity the miseries of others. 
My story is short and simple. I love the most amiable of women. I was beloved. The avarice of our parents, who both had more gainful views for us, prevented an union on which our happiness depended. My Louisa, who was threatened with an immediate marriage from a man she detested, proposed to me to fly the tyranny of our friends. She had an uncle at Quebec, to whom she was dear. The wilds of Canada, said she, may afford us that refuge our cruel country denies us. After a secret marriage we embarked. Our voyage was thus far happy. I landed on the opposite shore to seek refreshments for my Louisa. I was returning, pleased, with the thought of obliging the object of all my tenderness, when a beginning storm drove me to seek shelter in this bay. The storm increased, I saw its progress with agonies not to be described. The ship, which was in sight, was unable to resist its fury. The sailors crowded into the boat. They had the humanity to place my Louisa there. They made for the spot where I was. My eyes were wildly fixed on them. I stood eager on the utmost verge of the water. My arms stretched out to receive her. My prayers ardently addressed to heaven. When an immense wave broke over the boat, I heard a general shriek. I even fancied I distinguished my Louisa's cries. It subsided. The sailors again exerted all their force. A second wave. I saw them no more. Never will that dreadful scene be absent one moment from my memory. I fell senseless on the beach. When I returned to life, the first object I beheld was the breathless body of my Louisa at my feet. Heaven gave me the wretched consolation of rendering to her the last sad duties. In that grave all my happiness lies buried. I knelt by her and breathed the vow to heaven to wait here the moment that should join me to all I held dear. I every morning visit her loved remains and implore the God of mercy to hasten my dissolution. I feel that we shall not long be separated. I shall soon meet her to part no more. He stopped, and without seeming to remember he was not alone, walked hastily towards a little oratory he has built on the beach, near which is the grave of his Louisa. I followed him a few steps. I saw him throw himself on his knees, and respecting his sorrow, return to the house. Though I cannot absolutely approve, yet I more than forgive, I almost admire his renouncing the world in his situation. Devotion is perhaps the only balm for the wounds given by unhappy love. The heart is too much softened by true tenderness to admit any common cure. Seven in the evening. I am returned to Madame de Roche and her friends, who declined visiting the hermit. I found in his conversation all which could have adorned society. He was pleased with the sympathy I showed for his sufferings. We parted with regret. I wish to have made him a present, but he will receive nothing. A ship for England is in sight. Madame de Roche is so polite to send off this letter. We return to her house in the morning. Adieu, my Lucy. Yours, Ed Rivers. Letter 33 To Miss Rivers, Clare Street, Quebec, October 12. I have no patience with this foolish brother of yours. He is rambling about in the woods when we want him here. We have a most agreeable assembly every Thursday at the General's, and have had another ball since he has been gone on this ridiculous ramble. I miss the dear creature wherever I go. We have nothing but balls, cards, and parties of pleasure, but they are nothing without my little rivers. I have been making the tour of the three religions this morning, and as I am the most constant creature breathing, and come back only a thousand times more pleased with my own. I have been at Mass, at church, and at the Presbyterian meeting. An idea struck me at the last, in regard to the drapery of them all, that the Romish religion is like an overdressed, tawdry rich citizen's wife, the Presbyterian like a rude, awkward country girl, the Church of England like an elegant, well-dressed woman of quality, plain in her neatness, to quote Horace, who is my favourite author. There is a noble, graceful simplicity both in the worship and the ceremonies of the Church of England, which, even if I were a stranger to her doctrines, would prejudice me strongly in her favour. Sir George sets out for Montreal this evening, so do the House of Melmoth. I have, however, prevailed to Emily to stay a month or two longer with me. I am rejoiced Sir George is going away. I am tired of seeing that eternal smile, that countenance of his, which attempts to speak and says nothing. I am in doubt whether I shall let Emily marry him. She will die in a week of no distemper but his conversation. They dine with us. I am called down. Adieu. Eight at night. Heaven be praised, our lover is gone. They parted with great philosophy on both sides. They are the prettiest mild pair of inamoratos one shall see. Your brother servant has just called to tell me he is going to his master. I have a great mind to answer his letter and order him back. Letter 34 To Miss Rivers, Clarges Street, October 12th I have been looking at the estate Madame de Roche has to sell. It is as wild as the lands to which I have a right. I hoped this would have amused my chagrin, but am mistaken. 
Nothing interests me. Nothing takes up my attention one moment. My mind admits but one idea. This charming woman follows me wherever I go. I wander about like the first man when driven out of paradise. I vainly fancy every change of place will relieve the anxiety of my mind. Madame de Roche smiles and tells me I am in love. Tis, however, a smile of tenderness and compassion. Your sex have great penetration in whatever regards the heart. October 13th. I have this moment a letter from Miss Firma to press my return to Quebec. She tells me Emily's marriage is postponed till spring. My Lucy, how weak is the human heart! In spite of myself, a ray of hope. I set off this instant. I cannot conceal my joy. Letter 35 To Colonel Rivers at Quebec London, July 23rd you have no idea, Ned, how much your absence is lamented by the dowagers, to whom, it must be owned, your charity has been pretty extensive. It would delight you to see them condoling with each other on the loss of the dear charming man, the man of sentiment, of true taste, who admires the maturer beauties, and who thinks no woman worth pursuing till turned of twenty-five? Tis a loss not to be made up, for your taste, it must be owned, is pretty singular. I have seen your last favourite, Lady H, who assures me, on the word of a woman of honour, that, had you stayed seven years in London, she does not think she should have had the least inclination to change. But an absent lover, she well observed, is, properly speaking, no lover at all. Bid Colonel Rivers remember, said she, what I have read somewhere, the parting words of a French lady to a bishop of her acquaintance. Let your absence be short, my lord. And remember that a mistress is a benefice which obliges to residence. I am told you had not been gone a week before Jack Wilmot had the honour of drying up the fair widow's tears. I am going this evening to Vauxhall, and tomorrow propose setting out for my house in Rutland. From whence you shall hear from me again. Adieu. I never write long letters in London. I should tell you I have been to see Mrs. Rivers and your sister. The former is well, but very anxious to have you in England again. The latter grows so very handsome, I don't intend to repeat my visits often. Yours, J. Temple. Letter 36. To John Temple, Esquire, Pall Mall, Quebec, October 14th. I am this moment arrived from a ramble down the river, but, a ship being just going, must acknowledge your last. You make me happy in telling my dear Lady H. has given my place in her heart to so honest a fellow as Jack Wilmot, and I sincerely wish the ladies always choose their favourites as well. I should be very unreasonable indeed to expect constancy at almost four thousand miles distance, especially when the prospect of my return is so very uncertain. My voyage ought undoubtedly to be considered as an abdication. I am to all intents and purposes dead in law as a lover, and the lady has a right to consider her heart as vacant, and to proceed to a new election. I claim no more than a share in her esteem and remembrance, which I dare say I shall never want. That I have amused myself a little in the dowager way I am very far from denying, but you will observe it was less from taste than the principle of doing as little mischief as possible in my few excursions to the world of gallantry. A little deviation from the exact rule of right we men all allow ourselves in love affairs, but I was willing to keep as near it as I could. Married women are, on my principles, forbidden fruit. I abhor the seduction of innocence. I am too delicate, and, with all my modesty, too vain, to be pleased with venal beauty. What was I then to do, with a heart too active to be absolutely at rest, and which had not met with its counterpart? Widows were, I thought, fair prey, 
as being sufficiently experienced to take care of themselves. I have said married women are, on my principles, forbidden fruit. I should have explained myself. I mean in England, for my ideas on this head change as soon as I land at Calais. Such is the amazing force of local prejudice that I do not recollect having ever made love to an English married woman, or a French unmarried one, marriages in France being made by the parents and therefore generally without inclination on either side. Gallantry seems to be a tacit condition, though not absolutely expressed in the contract. But to return to my plan, I think it an excellent one, and would recommend it to all those young men about town who, like me, find in their hearts the necessity of loving before they meet with an object capable of fixing them for life. By the way, I think widows ought to raise a statue to my honour for having done my possible to prove that, for the sake of decorum, morals and order, they ought to have all the men to themselves. I have this moment your letter from Rutland. Do you know I am almost angry? Your ideas of love are narrow and pedantic. Custom has done enough to make the life of one half of our species tasteless. But you would reduce them to a state of still greater insipidity than even that to which our tyranny has doomed them. You would limit the pleasure of loving and being beloved, and the charming power of pleasing, to three or four years only in the life of that sex which is peculiarly formed to feel tenderness? Women are born with more lively affections than men, which are still more softened by education. To deny them the privilege of being amiable, the only privilege we allow them, as long as nature continues them so, is such a mixture of cruelty and false taste as I should never have suspected you of, notwithstanding your partiality for unripened beauty. As to myself, I persist in my opinion that women are most charming when they join the attractions of the mind to those of the person, when they feel the passion they inspire, or rather, that they are never charming till then. A woman in the first bloom of youth resembles a tree in blossom, when mature, in fruit. But a woman who retains the charms of her person till her understanding is in its full perfection is like those trees in happier climes, which produce blossoms and fruit together. You will scarce believe, Jack, that I have lived a week tete-a-tete -tete in the midst of a wood, with just the woman I have been describing, a widow extremely my taste, mature, five or six years more so than you say I require, lively, sensible, handsome, without saying one civil thing to her, yet nothing can be more certain. I would give you powerful reasons for my insensibility, but you are a traitor to love, and therefore have no right to be in any of his secrets. I will excuse your visits to my sister, as well as I love you myself. I have a thousand reasons for choosing she would not be acquainted with you. What you say in regard to my mother gives me pain. I will never take back my little gift to her, and I cannot live in England on my present income, though it enables me to live en prince in Canada. Adieu, I have not time to say more. I have stole this half-hour from the loveliest woman breathing, whom I am going to visit. Surely you are infinitely obliged to me. To lessen the obligation, however, my calash has not yet come to the door. Adieu, once more. Yours, Ed Rivers. End of Letters 31-36